Matt here from chemistrystudent.com. In this video, we're going to look at rate determining steps and how rate equations can be used to predict reaction mechanisms. We're going to talk about the link between rate equations and rate determining steps, how rate determining steps can be used to predict the pathway a reaction follows, its mechanism, and show all of this in detail with examples of SN1 and SN2 mechanisms for the hydrolysis of primary and tertiary halogenoalkanes. Rate equations and orders of reactions have been covered in separate videos. Check the links in the description below. Before we talk in detail about rate determining steps and mechanisms, there are a few essential ideas you need to be comfortable with. Rates of reaction describe how quickly reactions are occurring. They can be measured in terms of the speed at which reactant concentration decreases or the speed at which product concentration increases, given the units mole per decimeter cubed per second. Orders of reaction with respect to a particular reagent show the mathematical effect of changing concentration on the rate of reaction. They are written as a small number as a superscript to the reagent in square brackets, representing concentration. Orders of reaction can only be determined using experimental data. Rate equations show how changing the concentrations of reactants affects the rate of a reaction and allows us to calculate the rate of a reaction based on concentrations of reactants at a specific temperature. Rate equations contain three parts, rate, units of mole per decimeter cubed per second, concentrations of reactants raised to their orders, units of mole per decimeter cubed, and a rate constant k, given a general arrangement of rate equals rate constant k multiplied by concentrations of reactants raised to the power of the order of the reaction with respect to their concentration. Recap done, let's go. Many reactions in chemistry don't happen in one step. We like to think of reactions as just being particles hitting each other and bang, new products get formed. In reality, however, there are sometimes several steps that have to occur in a correct sequence in order for a set of reactants to turn into new products. As these steps happen very fast and on a tiny scale, it's nearly impossible for us to know exactly how such reactions occur. All we can do is predict how the reactions occur and model them using things called mechanisms, showing each step in terms of bonds being broken and formed. One major source of information for predicting mechanisms comes from reaction rate data and more specifically, the rate equation for a given reaction. Rate equations are based on experimental data, meaning they aren't based on predictions or theory. So if we study the rate equation for a reaction carefully, we can often find information and clues about the steps occurring in the reaction. The biggest clue we can obtain from such data is information about the slowest step that happens in a reaction. We call this the rate determining step. The reason the slowest step occurring in a reaction is important is that it is the slowest step that determines the overall rate of a reaction. This is a bit like a production line in a factory. Imagine you're in a small factory packing boxes of an item. If the items take longer to get to you on a conveyor belt than the length of time it takes you to pack them, then how quickly boxes get filled isn't really based on you, it's based on how quickly the items get to you. There are technically two steps going on here, the items moving to you on the conveyor belt and then you packing them. However, the overall rate of packing is determined here by the speed at which the products get to you, rather than by the speed you can pack them. As you are packing them faster than they can travel to you, meaning the travelling of the item on the conveyor is the slowest step in the whole process and determines the overall rate at which the items can be packaged. Just like in a multi-step reaction, it is the slowest step or stage occurring that will determine the reaction rate. 
From this, we can make the link then that if the rate equation for a reaction describes how the concentrations of reactants affects the rate, and the rate is determined by the slowest step in a multi-step reaction, the reactants involved in the rate equation must be involved in the rate determining step of the reaction. Any reactants of the whole reaction that aren't in the rate equation must therefore be involved in some other step meaning the reaction must happen in more than one step. As confusing as this all may sound, it gives us very useful information regarding how a reaction may occur and enables us to predict mechanisms, showing each step. For example, imagine a reaction between reactants A and B forming products C and D. If the rate equation for this reaction is rate equals rate constant K multiplied by the concentration of A, then this tells us that the slowest rate determining step doesn't involve reactant B, just A. We know at some point in the reaction that B must be involved as it's a reactant in the balanced equation, showing that products C and D aren't formed from just A meaning there must be at least two steps in the mechanism, one involving just A, the rate determining step, and then another involving reactant B. <laughs> at this point, I have to confess that anything beyond this becomes prediction. However, it's a prediction based now on actual data. It could be, for example, that A reacts to form an intermediate, let's call it E, and then this intermediate E reacts with reactant B to form products C and D. The second step, intermediate E reacting with reactant B, must be the fastest step as the rate equation only includes reactant A, which would mean step one is the rate determining step. The concentration of B has no impact on the rate of the reaction, meaning the step involving B must be much faster than the step involving A. This is why the concentration of B isn't in the rate equation, as it must be zero order. Classic examples used at this level are the reactions between a primary and tertiary halogenal alkane with hydroxide ions, both forming alcohols with each having a different rate equation, meaning the reactions must follow different pathways. We describe these pathways as SN1 and SN2 mechanisms. The hydrolysis of 1-chloropropane, a primary halogen alkane, has a rate equation of rate equals rate constant K multiplied by the concentration of hydroxide ions and concentration of chloropropane. This tells us that the slowest step in the reaction involves both the chloropropane and the hydroxide ion. The hydrolysis of 2-chloro-2-methylpropane, a tertiary halogen alkane, has a rate equation of rate equals rate constant K multiplied by the concentration of 2-methyl-2-chloropropane. This tells us that the slowest step in the reaction involves only the 2-chloro-2-methylpropane. The hydroxide ion isn't involved. From this data, we can propose a mechanism for each reaction. We could assume, for example, that as both reactants are involved in the rate equation for the hydrolysis of the 1-chloropropane, that the reaction occurs in one step. Hydroxide ions bond to the carbon in the chloropropane, and at the same time, the carbon-chlorine bond breaks. For 2-chloro-2-methylpropane, however, the rate determining step doesn't involve the hydroxide ion, meaning the hydroxide ion must bond to the main molecule in a different step. It's likely, then, that the carbon-chlorine bond in the 2-chloro-2-methylpropane breaks in a separate step before the hydroxide ion then bonds to the carbon atom in a second step. As breaking the carbon-chlorine bond is much harder and slower than forming a new bond between the carbon and hydroxide ion, it is the rate-determining step, and this is why the rate equation features only the concentration of 2-chloro-2-methylpropane. The concentration of hydroxide ions has no impact on the rate of the reaction.
This all gives two possible mechanisms. A one-step mechanism that involves both reactants in the one step, called an SN2 mechanism, and a two-step mechanism that involves only the halogenoalkane in the slowest step, called an SN1 mechanism. These mechanisms and what those letters and numbers mean have been covered in a separate video. Check the links in the description below. The purpose of this video is just to show how we can use reaction rate data and rate equations to predict reaction mechanisms rather than focus on the mechanisms themselves. So, to summarize, many reactions happen in several stages or steps. The slowest one of these steps will determine the rate of the reaction and is called the rate determining step. Rate equations will be based around the rate determining step of a reaction and can be used along with a balanced reaction equation to help predict the mechanism that may be occurring. Reactants and species in the rate equation must be involved in the rate determining step. I hope you found this video useful. Please check out other relevant videos in the links given in the description below and visit chemistrystudent.com for free notes and revision materials.